morning, everybody. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast, a weekly, actually twice a week show, that we put out about board games and the people who play them. I'm Tom Vassell, your host, and I want to say thank you to Pandasars, who's sponsoring this particular episode. Pandasars puts out quite a few good games. You can see uh, God's Love Dinosaurs here, but one of their most popular games, and certainly one of my favorites they made, is Dinosaur Island. Dinosaur Island is now back, available that you can get it. it includes, originally, it came only with one dinosaur shape for the different dinos. There are now three, although the price is the same. Click the links in the, in the video below if you want to buy a copy of it. We're also giving away three copies of it. All you have to do is email us at contest at dicetower.com and put the word pink because there's a lot of pink involved in Dinosaur Island, in the description, in, in the subject line, and then in the body, put your address, and we're going to run that for a week. If you win, we'll notify you. All righty. Well, here we are now, like I said, in the last sixth of the year in November. So what's going on now? What do we have to look forward to? Well, one of the things we look forward to is the holidays. Yes, Christmas is around the corner. Yes, you know that because if you go into any store, they've been advertising that since August. But Christmas is close. Yes, it's still a month and a half away. But this is the week we put up our Christmas gift lists. We call them the 12 games of Christmas and we put up a variety of lists of shopping guides. If you're looking to buy people things for Christmas, now's the time to start doing so. And so we'll be posting those throughout this week. We hope you enjoy those and look at those as a list of some possible good games that you can buy for others or hint to them to buy for you. All right, let's get started. Here we go. Over the course of this year, every once in a while on Board Game Breakfast, I'll talk about a game from 30 years ago. Today, that game is Journeys of Paul. It came out in 1990. Journeys of Paul is from Cactus Games. Uh, Cactus Games is a company that probably is best known for Redemption, the Christian-themed uh, collectible card game. Now, Redemption was definitely a ripoff of sorts of magic. Ripoff is a pretty strong word, but it was trying to be the Christian collectible card game. There's some differences between it and magic, but it did have a big following. Journeys of Paul is a game I played. Now, the original one that came out in 1990 was in a tube, you know, where the map came out, and I'm kind of glad they got that, and they got a box. I didn't play it till probably a decade later. But Journeys of Paul, essentially you are different people traveling around, trying to start churches before everybody else. Uh, it's inherently difficult to make a Christian-themed game like this because the Christians weren't necessarily competing to start churches and get deacons for these churches. But that's how this game worked. Uh, Cactus Games is probably the best of the companies to make Christian-themed games. Um, something that I wish companies would put a little bit more effort into because just a year later in 1991, uh, Bibleopoly came out, which is almost vomit inducing on how bad it is. Journeys of Paul is okay. I liked it more when I first played it. Nowadays, it's kind of just okay. It's a lot of just moving around as fast as you can. It's a race game to some degree, but there's not a lot of depth there. And other than the theme, this would be a very forgettable game. I mean, it is a forgettable game for most people. But it did give me a spark of hope when I played it where I said, hey, you know, I want to play some games at my church and things, and, may, and I'm going to look for games that have more themes like this. Unfortunately, even today in 2020, there still is not many games that are that good. But I still give props to Cactus Game Design for, you know, attempting this, and Journeys of Paul is not a pile of garbage like many of the games you could buy in bookstores at the time were that were Christian themed. So it has some fond memories for me, but it's also a game that I probably won't ever play again. Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Maple University. Today we are going to talk about The Lost Expedition. You probably heard of it. This is out a year or two years ago? Yep, it is. It has competitive and cooperative modes, but it's fundamentally a cooperative game where you and a group of explorers are cooperatively trying to make your way through the jungle to El Dorado, mm -hmm. facing all manner of normal jungle trials and tribulations. Trying to get our people cooperatively to here by playing cards one person at a time and then resolving it and hopeful, hope for the best. No, not really hope for the best, but. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a, it's an action, not quite an action program, it's an action sequence. So um, without talking to each other, 
the players will play one card at a time into a sequence. Um, in the first half of each round, the cards will be sequenced Morning, yeah. in the order of their number, and then in the second half, they'll just be sequenced in the order they're played. Mm. Then you go through and resolve them, and hopefully, you'll be able to skip over the worst effects, um, have food or ammunition when you need it, because ultimately you're going to face mm. yeah, cougars and venomous spiders and, and anacondas who are going to mm. harm your explorers if you can't deal with them. It has got some hidden information where, you know, no alpha player can take control of things and ultimately it's decided by uh, one person as the leader. Yep, I think it's suitable for it's suitable for all age groups. It would work as a family game. It's a good uh, learning sort of cooperative game. It. Yeah, it's the sort of thing you would play at the start of a public meetup potentially. Um, yeah, simple and fun. And we are Meeple University on YouTube and also on the Dice Tower. See you next time. Hi everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. And have you, dear viewer, ever wondered how the Electoral College works? Why, yes, I have. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and so this game is Campaign Trail. This is all about the Electoral College. It's kind of got like an area control, area majority thing going on. If you have the most registered voters in a particular state, you get that state's Electoral College. And if you are able to get the most electoral votes by the end of the game, your particular party gets to uh, you know win the, win the race, win the presidency. So this is a game all about kind of the American Electoral College, yeah. electing the president. It's a game all about politics and how that, elect how that works without actually getting into like the details and the policies yeah. and the things that kind of can get divisive around the gaming table. This is just about, you know, the, the, the system itself, yeah. which I thought was kind of cool. It was really neat. And I, I liked, I mean, like Brian said, it, it didn't talk about politics at all. Like you would think this would be a political game, but it's not. It's really just showing you how this works, how, you know, you have to move to different places. You have to fundraise so you can do things. You have to put out different ads so you can do stuff like that and try to get people to register. And it was really neat to show how that works. And even when there was the debates that happened, when you were talking on an issue, you weren't saying what about that issue you were for or against. It was just the issue itself. So I just thought that was a really neat way to do that and to put out this game to where like you really can't get mad at anybody. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had a lot of fun. It has great bits, really thick cardboard, like a nice recessed board where the electoral votes build up. Yeah. Um, we had a lot of fun playing Campaign Trail. Well, if you want to hear more from us, you can always find us on YouTube or Facebook. We are Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Everybody, this is Ryan and Bethany, hoping you have a happy, healthy breakfast. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Today I want to talk about a yet another book here called The Infinite Playground. This is by Bernie DeCoven. And this book here, which actually has come out since Bernie has passed away. Uh, he passed away in 2018. And he is like the doctor of fun. It's really hard to describe him. In fact, the book mentions that. He wrote a good chunk of this book, although a lot of other people had their hand in it, especially since it came out afterwards. Bernie is the kind of guy who would come to schools and teach them games like the parachute game, where they make the parachute go up and down. And there's a lot of stuff in here. He did, he was major fun on the internet. Uh, there's a new major fun right now. Uh, uh, but he was the one who started that. In fact, he and I corresponded quite a bit uh, about 13 or 14 years ago when I was in Korea. We talked back and forth. He wasn't there necessarily to do critiques of games. He just wanted to know, is a game fun? Imagination is the infinite playground, he says time and time again in here. So this book kind of follows that. It's almost a collection of essays talking about fun, but he gives you ideas of fun activities to play with the kids. This is kind of sideways here from board gaming, although board gaming definitely comes from this. I fear that sometimes we take board gaming a little too seriously and we should just be having fun playing it. And that's kind of what this book brings forth. This book is inspirational. It is silly. It also takes fun seriously while not taking it too seriously if that makes sense so certainly one to check out it's called the infinite playground and uh, i'm sure it's available at a bookstore near you hi i'm ambi and today i'm going to talk about polyhedral park planner which is a puzzly park building roll and write game
In Polyhedral Park Planner, you'll be building four different features, trees, paths, water, and benches, in order to fulfill three different scoring conditions to get the most points. Each round, you're going to roll the six polyhedral dice, and you're going to use the numbers that you rolled in order to draw the different features on your map. Use the numbers that you rolled either to unlock a feature or to build that feature into a space on the map, but you have to have the exact number of the space on the map to build there. You can add up multiple rolls in order to get the numbers that you want, but you have to use every number that you rolled even if you don't want to. In order to score your features, they have to be connected all the way back to the center of the park, and if you have unconnected features, you'll actually get negative points for them. So you're going to need to plan what you're doing with each die roll in each round so you don't end up with a bunch of features out in the middle of nowhere and unconnected. The scoring conditions are chosen by three random scoring cards at the beginning of the game, so it can change each time. And in the solo mode, the scoring cards actually have additional objectives at the bottom that you have to do in order to win, and you have to get a certain score in order to win. In addition to the variety with the scoring cards, there's also a hundred different player sheets that you can use with the numbers laid out in different ways. So you're going to be building a different park each time. And since there are three different scoring conditions, even within the same game with the same roles, different players can go for different scoring conditions and their parks will all end up looking unique. So if you like spatial games that involve planning ahead, try out Polyhedral Park Planner. Bye! Hey everyone, how you doing? It's Clive and I'm back to talk about another board game that I haven't played but I think I would enjoy. Now, one game that I uh, I fell in love with when I first played it was a game called Blue Moon City. Now, I managed to... Uh, it was actually out of print when I fell in love with this game, so I chased down an old uh, Polish version of the game. The actual game is language independent, so it didn't matter, although it was recently republished. It's a really... Uh, I don't know, it's just a really fun game. You move your pawn around the different cities and uh, uh, the areas in the city and you play cards in order to gain resources. You mostly want crystals, which you can give, you know, donate to the temple and whoever gets to the top of the temple first wins. It's a really simple game to play, but there is quite a lot of strategy. It's easy to teach and I just I just really enjoy it, whether it's a two-player or four-player game. I it, it, it just works really well for me. Kind of one of my gateway games. Now, Rainer Knizia, who designed Blue Moon City, also designed a game called Blue Moon, which recently was republished as Blue Moon Legends. Now, Blue Moon uh, Legends is a very different game. It's very much a deck builder. You're playing cards, and it's a two-player only game. You're playing cards in order to attract dragons to your side of the table and whoever gets three dragons or the most dragons wins it's a completely different game it doesn't have all this sort of moving around the board and resource collection it's literally just trying to it's a, a dragon you know uh what, what do they call it a uh, uh, tug of war trying to get these dragons i like to play games i like you know seven wonders jewel and i like odin draven so I think I enjoy two-player games, and it's a that's a 30-minute game. I think I'd really enjoy it. I realise it's nothing like Blue Moon City, but I think I'd still enjoy it. But I don't know. I've always held off getting it. So I'm curious what you think. Do let me know. And until next time, bye! Did you know that today's high-end cars can have upwards of one mile of copper wire in them? Did you know that before the electric headlamp was invented in the late 1800s, automobiles used oil lamps for illumination? That's right, blinker fluid was kind of a thing. And did you know that in the two to four player game Koftwagen, players can develop, build, race, and sell cars in early 1900s Europe? Well, they can't, it does, they, they can't, it does. In Kraftwagen, players move along an action track with the last player on the track going next. These actions let players hire workers, research advancements, build car bodies and engines, compete in the Grand Prix, and if they're lucky, snatch up talented engineers who can change up gameplay. But in addition to these actions, they can invite buyers with particular interests to the upcoming automobile market and hopefully sell them cars for big, big colored coin currency. I mean, don't these things look familiar to you?
This end of round sales event approaches food chain magnate like levels of complexity as players determine what to sell, who to sell to, for how much, and which of their opponents might wreck their strategies. Also, don't forget, there's always more cars than buyers. Do you have the gusto to gut your industry competitors? Well, luckily, despite being five years old, Kraftwagen is still fairly easy to come by. 2020 has been a bum year for sure. I was lucky enough to be able to pick up a new car, but I also started a new board game channel. It's called Tabletop Toolbox, and I'm looking forward to sharing more thematic and strategic games with you in the near future. Until then, keep them shiny side up. So what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? First of all, you should always check out each Monday at noon. I do a live Q&A, so if you want to ask me questions, that's a good time to do so. But also, reviews. Each week, we, uh, we started a series called The Four Squares, which is me, Z, Roy, and Mike reviewing a game. Last week, we did Dune Imperium. This week, we're going to be doing Holy Festival of Colors, and we're going to keep trying to do those as time goes by. But also, you can see other games up here. We talk about New York Zoo, the Night of the Living Dead zombie side game, uh, Cubitos, and more games. I try to do a mix of smaller and popular games to come out each week, so many different reviews. On the Dice Tower itself, the audio podcast, me and Eric are joined by Mandy, where we talk about our top 10 games that start with the letter U. Can you even make 10 games? Easily. Listen to that episode uh, tomorrow and find out. And of course, many, many other videos. Like I said, the 12 Days of Christmas. We do our crowd surfing on Thursday, on, on, on Wednesday, I'm sorry, on Thursday. We do board game breakfast. So there's a lot of fun things. We hope you check them out. Let's keep going. Happy breakfast, everyone. Today, I'm going to go over a quick comparison of these two Splendor variants. To instantly answer the question, are they massively different? The answer is no. First of all, Obviously, there is the theming, so everything is around uh, stopping Thanos, get the Infinity Gauntlet, collecting Infinity Stones to recruit characters. In the original, it was all about gemstones, merchants, nobles, and stuff like that. Otherwise, that's quite a sort of a direct replacement. Now, in the original, you only cared about points. Uh, in the Marvel version, there's sort of an added twist. Now, I thought this twist might be like a Ticket to Ride map variant, but unfortunately it's not. Um, the only difference here is that in Marvel uh, version, you have to have a card of each colour and a Time Stone, so the six Infinity Stones. The only way to get a Time Stone is to purchase a level three card. You didn't have to do that in the original, but I think a lot of times you'd probably have at least most colored of the colored cards and you'd probably get at least one level three because the amount of points it gave you. Now this is probably where I think theme wise it falls down because uh, Marvel, uh, it, the whole point is you're apparently stopping Thanos but you're not working together. Uh, you are competing to get the Infinity Gauntlet. And there you have it, Splendor Marvel versus Original Marvel. I've got a longer version of this on my brand new YouTube channel, East Gaming UK. Uh, I'll even talk about the Avenger tile, which is quite exciting about the new one. Um, otherwise, thank you for watching and I'm Oliver East signing out. Hey there, Dice Tower fans. My name is Dave from Gamevine, and I hope you are having a beautiful breakfast so far. Speaking of beautiful, I'm going to smash up a couple of games to boost their aesthetic appeal. The first one is hot off the heels of Halloween, and this is City of Horror. This game has a 3D aspect in it. It's a tower, but unfortunately, there's an issue with it. A lot of the copies that went out, the cardboard started to bow. I'm going to go to one of my favorite games that has a 3D piece in it, and that's Everdale. I'm going to replace the tower with the tree. Let me show you how that looks. Okay, so we are replacing this tower. The tree is a bit lighter in contrast to the board, but I actually think it looks pretty cool. Now, uh, you still have space for two people to be up here. Keep the water tower emblem here so you know what you have in play. But you know what? I'm gonna add a few more trees and bushes from Crossmaster Arena, see what it looks like. 
And this is the end product. Just a few trees and a big tree really makes it quite lively, doesn't it? So the next mashup is for everyone who bought the first edition of Camel Up. So the first component is getting the Oasis camels onto something that you can see. I made a little cardboard stand, but you can put them around the board if you want. We're trying to amp this up because we want to make your friend jealous that has the second edition. And a slightly closer up look of the camels here. Like I said, you can also use other camels and like through the desert, anything you've got at your disposal. But let's add some trees and really pump this up. So this is the full jungle set from Hero Escape, the trees and the bushes. I know it's pretty hard to get, but if you have it, you can make quite the smash up, which is totally gonna make your friend Jelly who has the second edition. Now for the pyramid, I got nothing, sorry, but I'll think on it. And that's all the smash ups I have for you today, gals and guys. My name is Dave from Game Vine. Come check me out at my channel. And until the next time that I see you, have a great breakfast. Bye, everybody. All right, let's take a break from talking about who and who is not allowed at our game table to talk about the innocuous rubber band. Rubber bands. Now, when you were a kid, when I was a kid, probably like me, you assumed that's how board games were kept together with rubber bands. Whether it's keeping the paper money together or the deck of cards in Monopoly, people use rubber bands. I never even occurred to me that you would not use rubber bands in those. Yes, when you took them off the things, then they were for you and your brother and sisters to snap at each other and shoot. But then you get yelled at and then you have to go find them because rubber bands don't grow on trees, as I was told. Fast forward to when I got into hobby board gaming. Then, forget rubber bands, we put everything into bags. Decks of cards into bags. As time went by, I found the bags to be more and more frustrating me. Yes, you know, I understand why people did not want to use rubber bands. People did not want to use them because if you let rubber bands sit around for 30 years, they do tend to degrade, they could get on the cards. And so people put things into bags. My problem with bags are, one, it made the box really messy looking. You have these bags everywhere. Bags don't fit into a box that well. And secondly, you got to be really careful about the size of the bag you're putting the cards into because pulling them out could be a chore and a task at times. I know some people think, <coughs> excuse me, not a big deal, <coughs> but bags could be that way. My problem was that kind of got annoying. So I decided to go back to rubber bands. And rubber bands themselves, very easy. You just take your rubber bands, snap them on, throw them in the, in the game. Now, a lot of people have problems with me with the rubber bands because they say they degrade. The fact is, I don't think that's a big deal. Almost every issue I've heard of games where rubber bands degrade on them are games that have been sitting in the closet for 20 years. Well, if your games are sitting in the closet for 20 years, then you don't want to play that game anyway. If a game is constantly being used, I have yet to see any rubber band degradation on them. The problem that I've run into, so I've been rubber banding all my games. The Dice Tower Library, lots of rubber banded games. And especially if there's sleeves on them, the rubber bands don't cut into the cards at all. The problem I've run into rubber bands nowadays is the fact that they break. And I've been trying to find the rubber bands that don't break really easily. So I bought a nice little pack of rubber bands and I just opened this one here and it snapped on me. This is a colored pack of rubber bands and they all were breaking. I was opening games and all the rubber bands inside were broken. That's problematic. I don't want to go back to bags. So I know there are other options. There's this magic tape it's called where you can like, it looks almost like a thin plastic thing you put around cards. I can't stand it. It feels flimsy, weak, and it's fiddly to put on the cards or not. I thought about using hair bands because uh, they're not going to break ever. Uh, the problem is A, they're kind of expensive and B, they got that little metal piece on them sometimes and they, they just don't work well on cards. So I know there's probably good quality rubber bands or something similar to our bands, but I haven't found the perfect solution yet. I know some of you say, just put the cards in bags. Um, what are other options? I don't want to use the magic tape. I don't want to use bags. Many of the rubber bands I have are problematic because they're breaking. I want to find maybe a really good quality rubber band that barely breaks. If there is such a thing, I've done searches on Google and I'm having a hard time finding something along that line or something that's similar to our band. Even if it's pricier, I think I'm willing to pay it to keep all the games in the Dice Tower library safe. So that's it. Rubber bands. What do you think? What are your suggestions for me? Please mention them in the comments below. Remember, I read all the comments on all videos. Gotcha. 
Hey guys, it's Deanna. Today I'm excited to share with you another fun game that you can play with your kids. And today I'm gonna to be talking about the game I Spy Dig In. I Spy Dig In is a fun game for two to four players ages five and older. At the beginning of the game, players decide whether they will play on the gray side of the card or the colored side. On your turn, you have 15 seconds with a sand timer to use both hands to find as many items from your card as you can. Once all players have had one turn, then all players search at the same time for the remaining objects but can only use one hand. The first person to complete their card earns that card. The player who earns three cards first is the winner. What do you like about this game? I like it because it's really a challenge to find all the pieces before the timer runs out. And I also like it because all the pieces are so detailed old and stuff. Do you think other kids would have fun playing this game? Yes. So some of the things I like about this game is I like that the cards are double-sided so that one side is a little bit easier for younger kids and then the color specific side is a little bit more challenging if you have older kids. I will say that this game can get a little competitive in my family since I have four kids, but it's still a really fun game and overall we have really enjoyed it. So definitely check this out if you have young kids, especially ones that enjoy the I Spy books or Look and Find books, then they will definitely enjoy this game as well. But that's gonna be it for today. I'll be back next time to share with you another fun game you can play with your kids. Hope you guys enjoy the rest of Board Game Breakfast. Hey, welcome to another episode of A Fellowship of Meeples with Doug and Doug Gaming. I'm Doug Jr. and it's time to talk turkey. <laughs> You know, here in the United States, we have a holiday that falls between Halloween and Christmas, and that is Thanksgiving Day. And one of the things that we traditionally eat is a turkey, a big roasted turkey, which I love. And yet the word turkey has also come to mean something that's not so good. Today, we're going to talk about a turkey of a game that, well, just didn't live up to expectations. It's called... Winter Tales. Winter Tales was designed by Jocularis and Matteo Santos. Graphics and illustration were done by Jocularis and Andrea Olgiati. Let's take a quick look. Only the rules in this game are a little bit vague and hard, in my opinion, to understand, so I don't know all the rules exactly. I do know that this is a game where you take characters on a quest and during that quest, you tell a story. These little cards here, which were actually drawn by children, so during a quest, you would lay down one of these, and then you would describe something like, oh, I went down the road to pick up a tablet that looked just like the Ten Commandments. And then also, the other thing that attracted me was the incredible artwork. This has characters that you would know, like Snow White, the Scarecrow, Pinocchio, and many others that you would recognize, but they're drawn in kind of a Tim Burton-esque way. But the gameplay is just all over the place. There's no structure to it, in my opinion, and the conclusion is somewhat arbitrary. So I consider this game a turkey. Is this something that you would play? Let me know in the comments below. Hey, thanks so much for watching this episode of A Fellowship of Meeples. We'll see you next time. Have a great breakfast. And that's it for another Board Game Breakfast. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the fantastic contributors who do a great job. Stick around, folks. There's more coming your way. If you watch us today, don't forget we have a companion video that goes up at the same time as Board Game Breakfast called Week in Review, where we take a look at all the videos we put out over the past week. If you're wondering if you missed something, that will let you know. Come back and join us as we play Kapow! Live on Tuesday. Many different live videos go up throughout the course of the week, so we hope you join us for those. And thanks again to Pandasaurus. Check out their games. Don't forget Dinosaur Island, and don't forget to enter that contest. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. 
Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.